Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Carlson with Catholic on Tampa. We're doing another one of our online interviews. Today, I've got Rick Holmans, who's the CEO of the Tampa Bay Partnership. Rick, say hi and tell us about yourself. Hey, Bill. How are you doing? It's great to be with you. Um, as you said, CEO of the Tampa Bay Partnership, uh, a native of Boston. So welcome, Tom Brady, uh, to Tampa. And uh, lived, lived in New Mexico for 30 years, ran the Economic Development Corp here, and have been running the partnership since... Uh, uh, 2015, and so I, I've been to Cafe Con Tampa before a couple times, and uh, it's great to be with you in this uh, new COVID-19 format here. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to do this again. I think you've spoken a couple times, and uh, Dave Sobush has spoken, and, and you've yeah. had other folks, and you all have been a great source of information over the years. Tell us what the Tampa Bay Partnership is for anybody who doesn't know. Well, it's a it's a group of uh, the. We went through a change in 2015, 16, and uh, committed ourselves to public policy advocacy, uh, working on on regional issues that uh, really drive the competitiveness of our metropolitan area um, against uh, you know other communities across the country. So um, many issues need to be addressed on a regional scale. Things like transportation, transit, uh, workforce. Uh, and so we occupy that space where we're trying to bring people together, identify those issues and, and drive solutions. So we're very focused on a couple of issues. Uh, most, most of our time has been, been, been put into transportation and transit over the last four years, uh, workforce development as well. And uh, we've obviously, just like everybody else, uh, have turned all of our attention to this coronavirus in the last uh, couple of months, and 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 beginning to you know looking at uh, the data as to how far we are declining in terms of our economic uh, health when we hit the bottom, and uh, tracking our recovery as we come up, and looking at as much data as we can to try to guide us and guide our leaders to make the best decisions possible. And your board is kind of a who's who of business leaders in the region, right? Well, there's a, there's about 40 CEOs um, that comprise the the board of the partnership. We we keep it intentionally small so that we can have conversations amongst the uh, the, the the people. Staff of five people, um, uh, very talented uh, group, and again, uh, extremely focused on on key public policy and advocacy issues. So. Not afraid to get into a little tussle here and there when we when we need to, but um, we're 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 an organization that is really committed to the the uh, the betterment of the entire community and all the residents of Tampa Bay. It is not a group that is uh, advocating for specific business interest. It's really advocating for the interest of the community at large. And by the way, Catholic on Tampa style. If you have any questions, you can post them on the feed, either at the bottom of uh, the screen or to the right. If you're watching on a PC or laptop, you can double click on the video and then the, the screen will be on the right that will tell you uh, how you can ask questions or post questions. And then on the phones, if you double click on the video, it's underneath. Some folks were asking us about that uh, a few days ago. Um, Rick, you have some slides you wanna show us about uh, the COVID-19 study, but before you get to that, could you just tell us, you mentioned that you track uh, the economics of the region and I'll put you on the spot. I know you didn't bring the slides, but could you give us like a 30 second snapshot of um, your uh, co regional competitiveness uh, study and what kind of, where, where were we before COVID-19 hit? How does Tampa Bay as a region compare to other places? And, and by the way, maybe define Tampa Bay also, please. Well, uh, the, the Tampa Bay that we have in the regional competitiveness report is a uh, is the eight counties, um, but it can be broken down into the uh, three MSAs that make that up or to individual counties to compare them with, with one another. And, and generally it's the, the Hillsborough and Pinellas together that drive the numbers uh, and it's proportionally weighted to the population, you know, which is uh, essentially uh, predominantly Hillsborough and Pinellas. Uh, what the the competitiveness report is 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 it's a framework for prosperity. So there are are different drivers um, such as uh, infrastructure and innovation and uh, civic quality um, that that we measure with a combination of sixty different indicators. Um, 
that are available through public sources. Um, so they're they're unimpeachable. They're they're not subjective. They're highly objective, and uh, but together they create a picture of of what, what are the indicators that we should be measuring as a region to track our prosperity as we move, move forward and to see how competitive we are with other communities. So we take all these indicators and we put them up against 19 other uh, peer markets in the country uh, so that we can measure ourselves. And, and that's very instructive uh, and important to do because sometimes here in Tampa Bay, we get into our bubble and we see the cranes, we see the construction, we see you know the traffic building, and we don't have the, any context to put that in. And so what this does is it puts our growth and development and our economic indicators into the context of how's the competition. And so what all, it showed- So we're all boosters of our cities and our region, and we all wanna look at the best, as you said. Yeah. Uh, could you just give us the, the you know, 30 second view of, um, what, what do you think are the highlights of what we, what we were doing really well before this crisis and what, it, what areas did we need to improve as a result? Well, what we were doing really well is growing. Our population was growing. And, and, and where we need to work is, is the, uh, the, the, the makeup of our economy. You know, we are essentially a, a service, retail, hospitality-based uh, economy, which puts us especially at risk with this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, our average wages compared to the 20 are at the bottom. Um, our educational attainment level, so percentage of the uh, population that has a associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a advanced degree is 19 or 20 out of the 20 markets. Our labor force participation, uh, 19th out of the 20 markets. Uh, and a really telling indicator is our gross regional product per capita. Um, because that, that's really a way to kind of normalize the, the, the health and the wealth of our economy. And, and in that indicator, we're 20th as well. And we're, we're way behind uh, the top quintile. Uh, I think our number is something like uh, around $40,000 uh, per capita. And the ones that are high performing are in the 70s and 80,000 uh, per capita. So there's a, there's a big difference there. And uh, I think it reflects the lack of a, a quite frankly, the lack of an economic development strategy for the region as a whole. Uh, and, and we've got a ways to go there. And that, that task is going to become even more critical and even more difficult uh, post-pandemic uh, as we get into that. the you, you talked a minute ago about how the Tampa Bay Partnership has it changed a few years ago. Who owns that strategy now or who owns the solutions for this? There really is not a group that um, has the regional economic development strategy, and there no, nobody ever really has had that strategy in the in the past. The partnership at one point produced a uh, a business plan for the uh, for the region, but there was never quite as before my time. But there was never quite frankly the buy-in from the entire region, and you've got to go through a whole process to um, you know to to create something like that and then to execute on something like that. Um, the the regional competitiveness report uh, gives us the framework. It, the first thing it does it gives us a common language to speak with each other. Is average wage is uh, disconnected youth sixteen to twenty four population that doesn't have a job is not in school is that important to look at of course it is important and when you measure us against other markets again we're at the bottom of the list there but this gives us a uh, a set of metrics to look at and talk about together so we can develop a strategy and as we execute the strategy we can track our our performance and our progress and results which we've never had before. It's like a, a business. A business has a dashboard. It looks at, uh, you know, w where it's doing well, where it's not doing well, and it comes up with strategies to do better where it's uh, not performing well. We as a community one, one don't have question. that. Sorry, one last question um, uh, g before we go on to what's happening today. Um, uh, you mentioned diversity of our economy. How do we do that? How do we make our economy uh, diverse? I know. Folks have been talking about that for 50 or more years. How do we make that happen? Well, you, you, you find areas of, of, of strength and you make them even stronger. And it's interesting looking at uh, Steve Carell, the new president of, of the University of South Florida, because um, that's the background he comes from in the Bay Area and in, in Texas is 
from a research university standpoint, you know, finding uh, what it's really good at, and then building an economy around it, building partnerships around it. I happen to think one of the things that we are exceptional at in Tampa Bay is data and big data. And I think that that is going to be an area that's going to be uh, even more important, more critical as we go forward post pandemic, as we uh, get into issues like uh, contact tracing, as we uh, cybersecurity, things like that. Um, I think we have opportunities in Tampa Bay to move very quickly to be a player in a market like that. But that's, uh, it's a decision that has to be made by the leadership and one has to concentrate resources and, and effort and energy into it. And one has to you know, track one's performance and, and uh, set high goals. And I don't know that we've, uh, we've, we've ever done that as a, a, as a community. Well, I thank you for being honest in the numbers. I know you've been working with Moaz and his team at USF, but uh, just like with a business, it, you have to look at, as you said, you have to look at their real numbers to try to improve. And so thank you for doing that and for, um, uh, for, for bringing our attention to it. Um, by the way, just to remind anybody, um, if you want to ask a question, you can post it underneath or to the side of, um, of the video and we'll try to get as many questions as we can. Now, without further ado, you've just done some, some research on the COVID-19 situation. Have you done it six or eight times already? Can you tell us uh, what the feedback is and, and how it's trending? Well, Bill, let me uh, thank you. Let me let me tell you the project that we've done, and and I think that you posted on the uh, announcement for this talk. Uh, people can subscribe to this State of the Region COVID nineteen newsletter, which uh, we're, we we would welcome uh, new subscribers. But we entered into this project with the United Way, Suncoast, with Community Foundation of Tampa Bay, and with the Muma College of Business at the University of South Florida. And the idea was at the beginning that we would do one newsletter a week looking at, at unique data that would um, give us insights into the impact of COVID-19. It's pretty much turned out that we've, we're producing uh, two to th usually three newsletters a week. There's so much good data to report. I, I should qualify good. There's um, a lot of data to report, some of which is not so good. Um, and uh, we've also uh, invested in a survey that we do every two weeks. We've just uh, published our second survey. The, the, the third one will be in the field uh, later this week and we'll um, publish it a week from Friday. But the purpose of that survey is really to track uh, uh, public opinions and public sentiment, how people are feeling, confidence levels, what as we reopen the economy, um, how secure do people feel about uh, attending, you know, sporting events or going back to work or going out to eat at a restaurant? What kind of things would they need to see? So, um, we we we've done a, a a number. We've done nine reports so far, and one can go back if one subscribes and 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 look at each one of them. But the one that came out on Friday is all about the um, uh, the second survey. And if you don't mind, I, I wanna walk you through some of the results of that. Um, yeah. I think that would be interesting. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna walk through this and hopefully you can see that slide on the, uh, on yep. the screen. And um, what I, let me see. You know, and I, I know I knew this would happen. Where? Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so let me just start um, some key takeaways at the beginning. And again, this this uh, survey was done April fifteenth and sixteenth, and the one before that was done April first and second. So this this has some a little bit of lag time on it but the four key takeaways were number one uh people are feeling a lot more optimistic about getting through this crisis but they're still cautious about reopening the economy um residents who have lost their jobs one in four working residents lost their jobs um they were feeling they're starting to feel a little better about their prospects uh, going forward. And you'll see some numbers that are, are pretty pronounced about Can that. Can I stop you there for a second, Rick? Um, I was listening to Jerry Parrish from, um, from Florida Chamber, I think it was last week, and forgive me if I get the number wrong, but I think he was projecting uh, by midsummer, by the, by the beginning of the end of this, 
that that the unemployment rate would be up to about 20% where it was like around three and a half before. Um, but, but based on what you're saying on this survey, it could be as high as 25% right now. Is that kind of, I mean, can we correlate those two or not? No, I, you, you, you can't. Uh, and, and I asked my team, why can't I? And, and there was a lot of reasons why, <laughs> why, why you can't correlate them. But I will tell you that the, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council did a, their economic model, which we published uh, last week. And they show our, our forecasting that in the six county Tampa Bay area with about 2 million uh, employed residents, uh, 218,000, so over 10% will lose their jobs uh, during this pandemic. And they consider that to be a conservative estimate. So um, I think the numbers are, are, are all over the place. And one of the big problems is we really don't have a good feel because our, our state unemployment system is not working. Um, so we, 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 we quite frankly don't know what the numbers look like until we get a better sense of those uh, you know, people who are, are filing for unemployment through that, through that system. Um, but the, uh, the one thing to be very, uh, very cognizant cognizant of is this uh, pandemic is hitting a portion of our population, particularly the African American community in a very disproportionate way. And uh, the recovery has to be disproportionate as well to make sure that uh, this, this segment of our population is taken care of. And the, the final uh, thing is we've, we've, we, we assessed, we had residents assess their view of local uh, governing bodies and elected officials. And uh, Mayor Jane Castor came out uh, way on top on this uh, list. And you'll see the, the, the list. And it, it really does position her as a regional leader uh, because the people that we surveyed were throughout the Tampa Bay region. And this gives her an opportunity to be a, a people in the region view her as a, as a leader. But the, the, the first thing just wanted to, to show you is we, we asked um, whether where people felt we were in the crisis. And the first uh, bar that you see in gray is um, our survey from two weeks before. So you can see in each one of these cases that um, they really moved to sort of the halfway, the peak near the end. Uh, people are feeling like we are making progress through this pandemic and 47% of the residents believe we are more than halfway through the crisis, and that's compared to 19% two weeks ago. So a big jump there. Uh, when we ask them 30 days, 60 days, will we be better or worse? Again, uh, you can see that on the far left, better went way up 23 to 35% in 30 days. When you go over to 60 days, you can see it went up from 53 to 61%. And um, clearly, people are more optimistic and, and, and feeling like we're progressing. At the same time, while they're optimistic, they're, they're, they're very supportive of the kind of uh, restrictions uh, that have been put in place. Uh, social distancing, uh, wearing face coverings, a mandatory nighttime curfew, um, a lot of support for these kind of things, which which shows while they're optimistic, they take this uh, pandemic very seriously. And they're not so supportive of, uh, you know, this was before the governor, you know, announced his decision on the schools, but not so supportive of that, not so supportive of, of exempting places of, of worship. Um, then we asked them, you know, try to get a sense of how comfortable will you feel once the stay at home restrictions are lifted resuming some semblance of your former life. And so really one shouldn't pay too much attention to the numbers on the right. They're, they're just an indication of kind of the relative uh, comfort level that people have. But you can see that people are gonna be much more comfortable going back to, to work, going to a public park where there's open space to a beach. And then you get into going out to dinner, going to school. And then you move to the bottom to the, the, the big crowds, like uh, going to a sporting event, staying in a hotel, attending a concert, uh, flying on an airplane or taking a cruise. And uh, these are gonna be activities that people feel very cautious. They're moving slowly. They're, um, they're not quite ready for these. So this phased approach to opening up the economy is probably very essential. Um, People, more than half of the residents are very concerned about their, um, the impact of 
COVID-19 on themselves. And a uh, big difference here is you, you, you have African-American residents who are 76% you know, uh, concerned, very concerned about this. And that compares to 51% in the general population. So amongst African-Americans, they are uh, feeling particularly vulnerable. Uh, about this pandemic. And then we, we you know, and this is, I think, what one just has to look, look at between the first wave that we asked and the second wave. In each one of these areas, whether it's getting sick, food or supplies, paying bills, separating from friends, losing savings, um, people are less concerned about those things as we're moving, moving forward. So not appreciably so, but, but, but every single one of them was either the same or less, so there's movement there. Um, we asked, uh, you know, got a sense of, of what, 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 what has happened to people? Have they been working from home? Um, had their hours reduced, pay wages reduced? And generally within the margin of error, this all stayed uh, fairly similar, um, except there's more people working from home. Uh, but one in four working residents have been laid off or furloughed. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of people. And again, when you look at the African-American respondents to the survey, one in three um, have, have been laid off or, or furloughed. So a bigger impact uh, on that community. Um, what, what really stood out um, two weeks prior to this was when we asked uh, people who had been uh, laid off or furloughed how much time they felt they could support themselves. It was 19 days, so a very short fuse. And um, this survey that we did, it, it was extended to 35 days. Um, and you know, we, 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 the survey doesn't answer why do people feel like this, but one of the suppositions, assumptions that we have is that um, people were um, in shock you know, when, when all this happened around the beginning of the month. And now they've, they've settled in, they've been at home, they've had a chance to assess their uh, personal finances. Um, and they've begun to look at what opportunities might be there. And there's, uh, it's still critical, 35 days, but there's a little more, a um, uh, little of the pressure got taken off. Rick, um, do you think that that number um, is indicative of the, the subsidies or support from the government or is it um, I, just they're changing I, it? I definitely think that's part of it. I think the the, the economic stimulus. I think I, I also think there's a confidence level that the government is going to be there in some way. There's been a lot of statements made at the federal level um, that we're going to do whatever it takes. And in the last survey that we did, when we asked about the stimulus, um, people generally felt it was going to help the, uh, the 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 poor and the unemployed and the middle class. Um, they didn't feel like it was weighted towards the, the, the wealthy and big companies and, and, and all that. So they felt like it was on target. And I, and, and I think during this period, people started to receive their checks, and I'm sure that, that impacted it as well. Another uh, question that I just got online was um, that someone was surprised that the lack of ch child care was uh, not a bigger concern. Any insights into that? Well, I think most people are 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 at. I'm assuming they're talking about this year. Um, a lot of people are at home, you know, so they're with their child, with their children, with their families. Um, so that's not as critical uh, a need if you're if you're unemployed and you don't have the ability to leave the home and look for a job. Um, when people do need to, when 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 we start to reopen and we when people start that process. Obviously, that's going to become a, a, a much more critical issue uh, to deal with. Yeah, one thing we were talking about, uh, Rick and I were talking about before we went online, was um, how nice it is to, it, for some of us to work from home. You, know, you get to see your kids more than you normally would. And, and I wonder, um, and, and we were wondering together what that might do to the kind of the future of business. We know that working remotely has been you know, a big option for 20 or 30 years now. But now that everybody's got a taste of it, how many people will insist on it or would prefer that? Well, and, and Bill, I, I've got to say, and I, and I think that this is something that's happening too, and we're going to be probing this in the in in the future. But um, there's some of us who are are just so uh, so fortunate to be able to work at home, to be able to keep our job, and and um, and. But you know, I do, I I go every day thinking about uh, the, the 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 most vulnerable in our population who were 
you know, in about 30% of our population is em employed in these very vulnerable pr professions in the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, and who just have lost their jobs and, and, and have families to support. And, and they really have very little optimism on the, on the horizon, something to be optimistic about. So, um, you know, I keep that in mind every day. And we as a community are going to have to come together in a, uh, as we already have, but, but continue that. And I, you know, we've had some talks with some of the um, nonprofit providers on the front lines. And one of their big concerns is that, um, you know, people are giving right now to them. Um, but they don't realize, might not realize that this is going to, they need sustained giving, they need sustained support, and things will run out at the federal level. Our, our local governments are going to be strapped for funds, and there's going to be, have to be a much higher level of, of, of corporate and personal philanthropy in the community to, um, to help us during this recovery phase. But just a, an aside, um, so um, just a uh, Want to want to finish off with um, the political uh, figures a little bit, and I think what's you know what's interesting about about this is Mayor Castor, as I said before, um, just very very high positive when you add the excellent and very good together, um, and if when you add the good together, then you're you know in the 80, 80 plus uh, percent. As you look at this, you can see, you know, some pretty high polarization with Governor DeSantis and President Trump. There's a, you know, a strong group of, of very positive, very favorable, and there's also a, a, an equally strong or, uh, you know, group of people that rate them as, as poor leadership during this, this time. So um, th this, uh, we're, we're going to be tracking this as we go forward, which, uh, which should be interesting. But the, the final thing is, which kind of relates to that uh, to some degree, is we asked uh, how people are going to know when this pandemic is over. And I think we're seeing this, you know, play out every uh, evening at the, the White House press conferences with the, the, the constant tussle between the public health experts, Dr. Burks and Fauci and, and President Trump. Um, people... Uh, have much more confidence in the public health officials, and they're um, they're looking to them to to bless and support and endorse any sort of reopening of the economy. So I think the message that this slide shows is that um, when as the government officials move to reopen the economy, um, for the public to feel to have a feel of of, of confidence and a, a comfort level with that, um, they've got to have the public health officials on board and. Um, so they've got to follow the science. They've got to follow the data um, in order to make these decisions. And so that's uh, that's where we are. What I wanted to do, put up this too, if people want to subscribe, um, they've got your link, but they can also go to stateoftheregion.com. This is the page that they'll see right at top in that red bar. They can just enter in their email address in that white area there. Uh, press subscribe and they'll get the next issue of the uh, of the newsletter. And thank you so much for sharing that with us and and also for inviting people to um, to get the newsletter and participate in the information. I mean, we've seen a democratization of information over the last 10 or 20 years. And <clears throat> I think some people may be surprised and I'm, I'm sure most people would be happy that, uh, you know, considering who your investors are, that that um, you're putting forth information like that and making it available to everyone. So thanks not only to you, but to your uh, investors as well. Um, you talked a lot about poverty. Um, you, you know, I, I put together a, a, a website, tampascorecard.com a few months yep. ago, which is similar data that, that you have um, on a city level that I also worked with USF on. And I think you're gonna be putting out some city level data, but the poverty rates <clears throat> in Tampa in particular are really bad and uh, in, in, in many parts of the region. Um, since you addressed it, what do you think might be some of the the uh, the issues with that? And if we have a chance to kind of reinvent ourselves uh, in the next ten years before the next crash, um, what do you think we ought to do differently? Well, I, I think one of the things that's happened, and this is a, a, a national issue, is the the digitalization of jobs. And um, I, I think that we, you know, the number of jobs that have, have increased to kind of medium levels and high levels of, of uh, competency with those uh, computer digital skills. And I think that's something that 
quite frankly, right now, as uh, there's a large group of people unemployed um, who are at home and who may have access to a computer, um, this is a great time to embed uh, those skills that are so necessary in the economy of today and the future um, in our population. So I, th I think we, we, we need to try to take advantage of this time uh, in order to, uh, in order to, to do that. Um, but we need to, to, to focus on um, what skills we, we actually need, what, what, what industries we want to grow, and, and, and what kind of requirements, skill requirements it's going to take to, uh, you know, to be a leader in them and, and then get the job done. It's, um, when, when one doesn't have a, a, a strategy and a plan and a focus and a goal, um, one tends to go in a lot of different directions, and it's not a very productive effort. And I think, quite frankly, the, 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 that's the story of, of, of Tampa Bay in many ways. We are um, pulled by different cities. We're pulled by different counties. We're, um, we're, we're combative and, and competitive um, uh, to a large degree, collaborative in, in some respects, but largely not. And I think that's fundamentally got to change if we are going to emerge on the national scene in a more competitive way. It's interesting that th how you're approaching this, and and I applaud you for doing it. Um, you know, we're we're really in a what I think is a consensus-based uh, community and economy now. That that the whole genesis of Cafe on Tampa is bringing information to the public and um, and and letting people network with each other. But um, that you know the fact that you're looking at these issues, and and unlike some organizations that stand up, you're not saying, "Hey, we come follow us. We have the solution." You're you're in a way. Asking, you know, asking the question, you're just providing the data, and it's an evolution. It's a really interesting process. So when you get, when you when you get to the next level, please come and talk to us about it. Uh, we have one, uh, we have another question that came through online, and then if anybody else has a final question, post it, please, um, under the live stream. But um, this is a, a, a question that came through a few minutes ago um, uh, from someone who's involved in transportation. But the question, it's not related to what we've been talking about, but the question was that the Tampa Bay Partnership was involved in, in selecting the last part CEO. Um, will, will you all be involved in that again? And, and where do you see, I'm, I'm gonna add to the question, but where do you see transportation going from here? Well, actually our, our involvement in the selection of the last CEO was to urge the, uh, the board of heart to step back and reconsider and to uh, set the bar even higher um, for a CEO who had a, was accomplished as a CEO of a of a, a same size or larger transit organization, so that um, we brought that kind of accomplished uh, experience to to Tampa. Um, they didn't follow that advice. Uh, I think Ben Lemmer was a really good guy, um, but did not have that CEO experience, and I, I think it showed in in what happened. Um, so we, we intend to stay involved because that's such a critical leadership position. But I, I think it's important to note too, Bill, that you know um, we're, we're all waiting now on pins and needles on this uh, Supreme Court decision as to whether the tax that we voted for in Hillsborough County uh, stays in place. Um, transit is one of our, the lack of transit is one of our biggest Achilles heels here in terms of being competitive. And data from USF from the Mooma College of Business has showed that the availability of transit is one of the biggest enablers of improvements in, in poverty and job opportunity uh, because it, it, it creates ways for people to access jobs. And uh, during this next period where we have such a high rate of unemployment amongst the, the lower class and the middle class and the people who are in these service and retail and hospitality jobs, without a good transit system, it's going to be that much harder to uh, connect these individuals with new jobs. And so that's going to be a, a big issue for us uh, as we go forward is, is what we do about transit and how we create more access to more opportunity in Tampa Bay. So I've spoken to both sides of the, the, the uh, court case and both sides feel like they're going to prevail. Um, if, we, if, if, it, if the case wins, uh, if all for transportation wins, uh, then there will be lots of money for planning and, and infrastructure and everything. If if they fail, um, it, it, based on the decision the county commission made last week or week before, I, I guess it'll be 2022 before anything will be put before voters again. What do you think we should do between now and then? Uh, what kinds of solutions could we get uh, considering where we are now? Well, we, we've been working very hard. To, I mean, our, our focus has been on 
on, on these referendums, number one, but also on most importantly on this regional rapid transit system connecting Wesley Chapel um, all the way down to St. Pete on a dedicated transit way. And as the Tampa Bay Next project moves forward, um, uh, there's an opportunity to build this um, dedicated transit way into that and to stand up a, a at least a, re a regional connection that the local systems can then plug into and give us the framework for a regional transit system going forward. So uh, we intend to keep pushing that uh, very hard. Um, I think we need to do everything we can to expand our bus service in the respective counties because those are the, the workhorses that get people to their, uh, to their jobs. And then we have to, um, if the Supreme Court you know, throws it out, um, we have to start doing the planning for 2022, both in Hillsborough County and I would, would, would hope in Pinellas County at the same time, because without local resources to match state and federal money, um, there's really no serious projects that can be done that are going to move the needle as far as transit is concerned. I've kept you too long, but I want to, if I could ask you one more question. Um, one of the things I think is really cool about your background is when you were in New Mexico, um, and I know you'll be embarrassed for me mentioning this probably, but when you were in New Mexico, you, you ha were known as a big visionary. You would think big, and one of the things you thought about was uh, creating a spaceport with Richard Branson, um, and you got to work with him. Um, so looking at that analogy, you know, who 10 or 20 years ago would have thought of that? And so it, you putting that big thinking hat on, what are some big ideas, if you don't mind sharing, what are some big ideas you have for Tampa Bay? Where, where could we go in the future? Well, I, I, you know, got in, I began to express one before, which is all around big data. And, and I quite frankly think that the, the healthcare industry overall, which we're very strong in too, um, has that kind of foundation going forward too, as people, uh, it's, it's very data-based and it's gonna be focused on, on wellness and keeping people healthy and all of the, uh, the, the connections like Fitbits and Apple Watches and all that, that are driving the consumer to stay healthy and stay out of the, what we know is the traditional healthcare system. Um, so I, I think the future of healthcare is all about data. And I think that Tampa Bay could play a very strong leadership role in the new models of healthcare and really become uh, an example. You know, one thing that I've um, always had as, as kind of an indicator of our success is we've taken benchmark trips to many other cities uh, to see this or see that and learn how did you do this. And in all my time here, which is, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, still relatively new, came here 2012, but I have yet to get a call from another, another market saying, um, we want to come to Tampa Bay to see how you did X, Y, Z. Um, I think we need to, we'll know we're on the right track when we start to get those calls, um, whether it's about our, our, our first, first highway-based regional rapid transit system, or it's about our big data approach to healthcare. Um, but um, that, that's an exciting place to be when people are looking to us for leadership and, and hopefully that will be in the cards in the future. Hey, well, thank you very much. Thanks for your big ideas and thanks for addressing the important yeah. issues that not everybody wants to talk about. But uh, please come back and uh, keep us posted on, uh, on the, the additional data that you find and what recommendations you have for the future. Okay, Bill. And listen, thanks for your service and thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Appreciate it.